Greetings and welcome back to 303. We are in Senior English A. We are in our hymnals on page 98 and following. We are in Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and we are working with the general prologue and more particularly with the characters of the general prologue. Two observations before we uh, get into this study. One, the first thing we want to say is that these characters for Chaucer are the future storytellers of his tale. Chaucer will make up these stories, but he will have these characters tell these stories. Number two, there will be a link. There will be a link. You want to write this down in your notes. There will be a link between the description of the character that Chaucer will provide us with and the story that they will tell. Now, the idea, and we'll see this in the general prologue expressed a little bit later, but let's say it out loud now. The idea is that they're going to go from London to Canterbury, and on the way there, on their holy pilgrimage, to their holy pilgrimage site to see in, in, uh, in Canterbury the, um, the, the site of the murder of Thomas a Becket, on the way there and on the way back, they're going to pull the entourage over to the side of the road. They're going to break out a few uh, brewskis for drink. And one person is going to stand up and going to introduce himself or herself. That's called a specific prologue. And then going to tell a story. But before we get there, Chaucer wants to introduce us to each one of the different characters in order. Now, some logistics out of the way. On page 98, notice that the word knight is italicized. Notice on page 99, line 81, the word squire is italicized. Do you see it? Every time you see one of those italicized um, words, that is the beginning of the next character. What you want to do right now in your notes, and we're not really necessarily working so much at levels 2 and 3, Periodically, we will, but for the most part, all we're asking is, can we work at level one? We simply want to summarize at least three things about each character. Three things about each character. We'll read for a few lines, we'll pause, we'll write down something about the character. Obviously, this is great exam prep for us, but it also helps us to be able to prepare to read the Canterbury Tales 2 tales that we will be studying. Now, I am hoping that you will seek out Canterbury Tales on your own to flesh out the study for yourself in your own time. From our textbook, we will only get the following. We will get a summary of the characters in the general prologue, as it's called, and then we will meet the partner's prologue and the partner's tale and the wife of Bath's tale. We will not be in our textbook introduced to the wife of Bath's prologue. However, I have some lectures that I will give to you specifically on the Wife of Bath's prologue, which is quite remarkable stuff as well. I'm with you now on page 98, and I'm with you at line 43. We are told, there was a knight, or if you're a Monty Python fan, a Kanigan. There was a knight, a most distinguished man, who, from the day on which he first began to write abroad, had followed chivalry, truth, honor, generousness, and courtesy. In other words, let's point out right away that the knight is from an upper class and he practices chivalry. That is to say, the code of the knights. Truth, honor, generousness, and courtesy. He's a good guy is what we're being told, at least at this point. He had done nobly in his sovereign's war and ridden into battle. No man more as well in Christian and heathen places and ever honored for his noble graces. In other words, this is a knight who has all of the knight knightly graces. By that we mean he behaves well. Especially towards women, he behaves well. We're also told at line 51, when he took Alexandria, he was there. He often sat at table in the chair of honor above all nations when in Prussia. In Lithuania he had written, in Russia. In other words, let's just put it down really quickly in our notes. The knight is a man who has traveled the world. Unlike most people of the England of his day who don't go very far away from the place they were born, there are people who will live and die within five miles of the place they were born. Our knight has traveled the world. He's been all over the place in serving as a knight, especially in battles. Line 55, 
No Christian man so often of his rank had traveled. When in Grenada, Alcindius sunk under assault. He had been there and in North Africa, uh, raiding Bernamering in Anatolia. He had been as well and fought when Anus and Attila fell. In other words, he's been in all these really famous battles, top of page 99. And all along the Mediterranean coast, he'd embarked with many a noble host in 15 mortal battles. He had been and jousted for our faith at Tamsmanin. Thrice in the lists, and always killed his man, this same distinguished knight had led the van once with the Bay of Ballot doing work for him against another heathen Turk. He was of sovereign value in all eyes. And uh, let's point out then, in other words, whoa, our knight has traveled, he has fought in famous battles, he has killed several men. So in other words, he is a famous warrior type, okay? And though so much distinguished, he was wise and in his bearing modest as a maid. He never yet a boorish thing had said in all his life to any, come what might. He was a true, a perfect, gentle knight. So let's point out that Chaucer will say about him that he is a gentle man. That's where we get our word gentleman from, gentle man. In other words, he has the correct way of, of acting. He has proper manners, we might say. Speaking of his equipment, that is to say what he carried, he possessed fine horses, but he was not gaily dressed. In other words, he didn't overdress. The knight doesn't seem to want to call attention to himself, which seems to suggest something about him, that he's not a really outlandish kind of person. We keep reading. He wore a Faustian tunic, stained and dark, with smudges where his armor had left mark. Just home from service, he had joined our ranks to do his pilgrimage and render thanks. So in other words, the knight has just come back from going off fighting in some battle somewhere. By the way, let's point out, Chaucer himself was a traveler. He had seen a number of different parts of Europe, and so he's going to add into this experience here his own understanding. Reading then about the knight might lead one or two right, readers to say, I wonder if someday I can see more of the world. Notice that the knight who has traveled all over the world is now going on pilgrimage. In other words, he's going on another journey. People who like to travel like to travel. Do you got me? Do you understand, in other words? So he's just come back from traveling, and guess what? He's ready to go on another journey. Well, now turn on page 99 to the second of our characters. The knight had his son with him, a fine young squire. So let's write this down. Our second character is the squire. He is the son to the knight. And we're going to learn what is a squire and what does a squire do. The first thing that we're told about him is that he's a lover and a cadet, a lad of fire with locks as curly as if they had been pressed. He was some 20 years of age, I guess. Now, let's point out, in other words, the squire is much closer in age to a high school senior. We're also told that he's a lover, he's a fighter, he's a lad of fire, which of course means that he's got passion. He can get really fired up. We're also told that he has long blonde hair, curly locks, right? As if they had been pressed. And he's 20 years of age. Notice I'm on page 99, line 85. In stature, he was of a moderate length. In other words, he's not real tall, not real short. With wonderful agility and strength, we would call him today, let's write it down, we would call him a good athlete. He'd seen some service with the Calvary and Flanders and Arteus and Picardy and had done valiantly in little space of time in hope to win his lady's grace. Now this will tell us something as well that the young squire is hoping to pick up his girl by proving what kind of warrior fighter he is. Okay. We'll continue at line 91. He was... Embroidered like a meadow bright, and full of freshest flowers, red and white. Singing he was, he loves to sing, or fluting all the day. He was as fresh as is the month of May. In other words, we're told that he is a happy guy. He's always singing, and he's always out looking for the next possible girl that he might meet, right? Notice, we're told about his clothing, the way he looks. I'm at line 95. Short was his gown. The sleeves were long and wide. 
He knew the way to sit a horse and ride. He's a good horseman. Let's write that down. He's a good horseman. He could make songs and poems and recite. Knew how to joust and dance, to draw and write. In other words, he was very educated. So let's write this down. Knights, would-be knights, young squires who are in training to be knights, are going to learn not only how to physically fight, but also how to be what we would sometimes call a scholar, a writer, a reader. In other words, in this representation, we have the marriage of both the, the athlete as well as the student, right? Okay, in other words, he has both of them. We're also going to hear about his private affairs. Uh-oh, he's a guy that likes to enjoy the company of one or two young ladies. He loved so hotly that till um, dawn grew pale, he slept as little as a nightingale. This will take us back to that line in the opening lines of the general prologue where the little birds are sleeping away the night with open eye, which is to say they're not sleeping at all. So let's just go ahead and point out he enjoys his evenings and he does not always sleep in his evenings, right? You can obviously draw your own conclusions here. This is a little bit of Horatian, soft or gentle satire. Notice we're told he slept as little as a nightingale, line 101. Courteous he was, lowly and serviceable, and carved to serve his father and uh, at the table. So in other words, he's going to be a gentleman. He's going to be training under his father. He's going to be there to try and help his father, okay? All right, let's go to the third character for us on page 100, the yeoman, the yeoman, okay? Now, you got a picture of the yeoman there on page 100. Notice the way he's dressed, notice his weapon, all of those kinds of things. Let's learn about this yeoman. You're, you're, um, he's an attendant. So, in other words, we've got three of these guys that kind of go together and put them together in your notes and in your mind. You've got the knight, you've got his son, the squire, and then you've got the yeoman who's kind of the attendant, the servant, we might think, the one, the one who's going to help him. Clearly from a different social class, but he is going to have privileges because he takes care of them. Let's take a look at the yeoman. There was a yeoman with him at his side, no other servant, so he chose to run. This yeoman wore a coat and hood of green, and peacock feathered arrows, bright and keen, and neatly sheathed hung at his belt the while. For he could dress his gear in yeoman style, his arrows never drooped their feathers low, and in his hand he bore a mighty bow. His head was like a nut, his face was brown. Why is it brown? Well, because he spends all of his time outdoors hunting and the like, and so his face, he's he suntan. He knew the whole of woodcraft up and down. In other words, he knows all about what it's like to be out in the woods. A saucy brace was on his arm to ward it from the bowstring, and a shield and sword hung at one side, and at the other slipped a jaunty dirk, spear sharp and well equipped. A medal of St. Christopher he wore of shining silver on his breast and bore a hunting horn, well slung and burnished clean, that dangled from a baldric of bright green. He was a proper forester, I guess. So let's point out a couple of things about our yeoman. One, he is a man who enjoys outs outdoors. He's not an indoor type, outdoors. Two, he loves to hunt. He loves to be in the woods. And he has all kinds of weaponry knowledge, okay, especially his bow. So we now have met three of our characters. The idea, again, is that each one of these three characters will at some point in Canterbury Tales tell a story. That was the original plan, at least, of Chaucer, okay? So go ahead and jot down then your thoughts about each one of those characters, and we'll come back in a few moments.